Hello, Photopillers! Rafael Dabar here, and welcome to another masterclass. Today, we're going to learn how to photograph the night sky with Rachel Jones. Welcome, Rachel. Welcome to the Hi. show. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> Where are you based? I am from Canmore, Alberta, which is just outside of the Rocky Mountains. So my my backyard is Banff and Jasper National Parks. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Yeah. I've been told that it's pretty warm now there, right? <laughs> well, it's warming up now, but we did have the polar vortex move through and wow. it was minus 50 Celsius on one of my shoots. So it, it got a little challenging. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> We're here at 11, 11 uh, degrees and I'm freezing. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, tell me, what, what, what are we going to see today? What, what are we so, going to learn? I am going to, I'm going to actually just walk everybody through my process. Um, I do a lot of stacking, stacking for noise reduction, focus stacking. Um, so I'm going to kind of go to the beginning and kind of give you an overview of some of the challenges with night photography. Um, and how I overcome those challenges. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to walk you through my process and how I plan shoots and show you some of my stuff. I even have some new work that I haven't featured anywhere that you get to see today. Um, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully you get to learn something and learn a little bit about my planning and yeah. Awesome. And I, I love questions, so ask me lots of questions. Yeah, that's right guys, I just write uh, uh, on the chat in the chat the questions you have and uh, Rachel will answer all your questions and I'm going to see uh, Aurora also oh yeah I'm going to just give a brief talk about how to shoot the Aurora as well um, nice. just because it's one of those things that even when when photographers are um, really competent at night and uh, and do a lot of night shooting somehow there's something that happens when the Aurora kicks off and the lights are dancing that our brains just turn off and we forget everything. So I'm going to run you through how I do how I do it and uh, kind of give you a little checklist to go through. Okay, Rachel, are you ready? Yes, I am. So who is Rachel Jones? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, well, so I do a lot of landscape and astrophotography. I am um, a Sony ambassador. I'm part of the Sony Alpha Imaging Collective and I do lots of classes with them as well. I do workshops. Um, my workshops are all over the world and um, online, <laughs> my new thing, online. And uh, you can find out about my workshops on my website at astralistphotography.com. Awesome, awesome. I, I think that we share a few, a few customers, right? Like Bruce Leonard. Hi, Bruce, are you there? Or Vanessa Franklin? Oh, Bruce. I hope Bruce is here. He's yeah. one of my favorite humans in the whole world. Yeah. Nice. What are we seeing now? All right. So this is actually one of my very first time lapses out at the ancient bristlecone pine forest. Um, this is way back in the day when I was still shooting on a cannon. But what I really like about this time lapse is that it really shows you how much the light can change. Um, as we move from sort of early rise of the Milky Way and as it fades out, you can see it goes from the warmer tones to the bluer tones. And um, that's just a perfect lead in for me to talk about how the light changes at night. Um, so a lot of people, when they first learn that I do night photography, um, one of the questions I get asked the most is, okay, if I wanna go out and photograph the Milky Way for the first time, what settings should I use? And that's mm -hmm. a really complicated question. And it's complicated because the light changes every night um, quite a bit, even if you're at the same location. So in, in this example, you can see that I have three shots of Emerald Lake Lodge in Yoho National Park. Um, the middle one is a time lapse. And uh, this is shot at night at, during a full moon. And I shot this at F16. And so with a time lapse, you kind of want to get everything all in one shot. Um, so it has to be clear in the foreground all the way through to the background. And then you do that 300 times or 600 times and, and compile it all into a time lapse. So this is single shot at F16. The one on the left is taken on a really cloudy night. It was shot at F8. It was much, much darker. 
Um, and I had to shoot the lodge separately from the foreground at F8. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that my foreground was really sharp. So this is two shots, one for the lodge and the background and one for the foreground. And then um, same location again, but on a story night. And uh, this one is actually five shots, I think, altogether. There's three shots in the foreground here for focus stack at F3.5, I think. Um, the stars were shot at F2.8 for a short short shutter. I don't remember which <laughs> what my settings were on this mm -hmm. one. Um, and then the lodge was shot at probably F11. And then those are all combined together. The focus stacks and the exposure blends all combined together in Photoshop afterwards. So I love using this single location as an example of how much the light can change and, and how that is going to direct our photography, you know, based on how much light we have. So I can't, I can't uh, tell you that any one setting is good for shooting anything, even Aurora or Milky Way or anything like that, because we're always going to have different levels of illumination from the moon or from the ambient glow of uh, light pollution or um, any sort of man-made man lights or light painting or anything like that that we do. So I am going to kind of give you an idea of how I approach night photography mm -hmm. um, and in a bunch of various settings. So something like this is actually um, many images put together. Um, I shot my sky for six seconds at f2.8, ISO 16,000, and then I stacked those together for noise reduction. So for anybody who's not familiar with that, um, there's a program called Story Landscape Stacker for a Mac or a Sequitur for a PC that you can bring in multiple images and um, high ISO. And what the program does is it has an algorithm that averages out where the stars are. And because noise, um, is random from image to image to image, it can actually average out the stars and take away the noise. So what you get left with then is a really, really clean image for your stars. And if you want really, really sharp stars, you have to use really low shutter times. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I do this stacking for noise reduction. And then my foreground is actually a single image um, taken at 30 seconds. F11, ISO 100, and it was a blue hour shot. So this image is a blue hour blend. And um, and altogether, it's about 21 images that uh, go into this particular shot. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel, for, for yep. we have a question from Rob uh, B. Uh, yeah. How many images are you stacking? Are you taking from for the stacking in, for the sky? Hmm. So the recommended is about seven. I tend to overdo everything. I tend to take way more than I need. I like having the extras um, just in case clouds change or something changes from image to image. And um, so I took I take 20 typically. And this one is 20 images. That's a good question. OK, so the reason why I go through and I take multiple images is because each part of the image um, when we're doing night photography needs Different, a different approach for, for photographing it. So I'll start off with shutter speed. Um, the longer the shutter, the more light we're going to let onto the sensor. But the trade-off here is that we get star trails if we open the shutter up for too long. And we might also see movement. So um, treetops move in the wind in a long exposure. Um, flowers, if you're shooting in the summertime. People, I've tried to photograph myself and I am like a giraffe when I get out in front of the camera. As soon as I know I have to hold still for 30 seconds, I just sway and I literally can't hold still. So, you know, photographing any particular subject, the longer we leave the shutter open, the more, the more chances that we're going to have of um, having some kind of movement in there. So this is an example of what it looks like if we have star trails. Um, the shutter was open here. This is actually an F8 shot and the shutter was open for 30 seconds. So at F8, we're gonna get way less trailing than we would at F2.8. Um, but you can see that the stars are not nice little spots. They're kind of elongated. Um, they look like more like little dashes. So to get sharp stars then, what we need to do is um, take really short shutter times. And so how I figure that out is I use photo fills. Not, shouldn't be much of a surprise given our talk today, 
Um, I get asked all the time about gear and like what kind of gear I recommend for night photography. I would rather have photo pills than a headlamp. So that's how much <laughs> I use it. And that's how important it is to me. So I love talking about it. So to figure out a time for uh, that's appropriate for your to figure out a shutter time so that you don't get star trailing, I use the function called spot stars. And I put in my camera's information. In this example, I have the Sony a7 III there. And it's at 16 millimeters and f4 for whatever reason I chose f4 in this example. So the default setting with sort of barely noticeable star trailing would be 18 seconds on that particular mm -hmm. camera with that particular lens. And the accurate setting, which is pinpoint stars, and I can put, I can print this and blow it up big and have it on my wall. Um, it's half of that time, it's nine seconds. So when I go out shooting, I really, I'm usually shooting at my widest aperture for stars and I use photo pills to determine the shutter. So the only variable I have left then to determine is my ISO. And if I'm shooting those really short shutter times, then I end up shooting with really high ISO. So when it comes to aperture, our wider aperture is going to let more light onto the sensor. The trade-off here is that with a wider aperture, we get a much shallower depth of field. So to get around that problem, I do a lot of focus stacking. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are not familiar with that. So I have a little example here of what that looks like. This is obviously daytime. It's a little easier to film than it is at night. Um, so I'm shooting there, some ice bubbles on Abraham Lake, and I'm shooting at F11. And I actually take um, between three and five shots. Sorry, I think three shots in the foreground and one midground and one background. So five shots at F11 to get the whole thing in focus. And then when I put that together in Photoshop, you get the image on the right, which is really sharp all the way through. You can see every detail of all the bubbles and the background. And um, so I have another example here for you of, um, this is five shots uh, shot at F11 and stacked. The, further, or the first shot there is focused on the mountain. And as I click through, you'll see that as I get closer to the foreground with my focus, the foreground gets sharper. So as I move back towards the background though, when my foreground is focused, even at F11, when I have really great depth of field, I, the mountain is out of focus. So then I need a shot that's focused on the mountain. So at F11, I usually use five shots to get everything focused all the way through. So you can only imagine then what it takes to get something focus stacked in the middle of the night in the dark if you're shooting at F2.8. I just shot this one the other day and it was 17 shots for the foreground. And I'm just clicking through the layers here in Photoshop so you can see that as I move from the foreground to the background, the stars get sharper and sharper and sharper. And my foreground is also going to get sharper if I can focus stack it than if I try to take it out of a single image. So here I'm going to show you what the background looks like when it's focused. That's focused on the stars right now. So you can see they're nice and sharp but the foreground is really blurry. So if I look at the top of the stack where I'm focused on the foreground at F2.8, that's nice and sharp now, but those stars are super blurry. So at F2.8, I have to take way more images to get everything stacked all the way through and have a nice clean shot um, than I do if I'm shooting at F11. And that's the resulting image. I just took this a couple days ago. Uh, we had a little aurora forecast here and um, it didn't produce much. It was kind of a nice glow on one side of the image and I had some urban glow on the other side and some just really cool ice cracks that to work with. So I kind of liked it. Beautiful. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so our last, our last consideration when we do night photography is ISO. Obviously with higher ISO comes some greater light sensitivity, but the trade-off there is that we get more noise. This is what a noisy image looks like. Um, this one is focused on the stars. Um, this is a raw file shot at ISO 16,000. And you can see in here that there's all kinds of noise. There's color noise, there's graininess. It's super, just really not nice. 
Um, if you zoom in on a high ISO image that's focused off in the background, the foreground just looks like mush. So here I have some gorgeous frost flowers that you can't even see the details of because of the high ISO um, and the fact that it's a really shallow depth of field image. So by focus stacking and, um, and stacking for noise reduction and getting really short shutters, shutter times in the sky, I can get really sharp stars and really sharp foregrounds. And how I go about that is totally dependent on how much light I have, which varies from night to night. Nice. So when I'm, when I'm out on location, I'm always thinking about um, photographing each part of the scene independently. So I think about is part of this, is part of the image moving? Do I have stars moving, clouds, treetops blowing in the wind? Am I standing in there trying to get a selfie? Um, because I cannot hold still. And then what ambient light do we have to work with? Is there light pollution, moonlight, starlight, light painting? You know, what other things can I work with? And then, so I think about shooting the stars separately from any of the foreground. When I shoot the foreground, I leave the shutter open much longer because I don't have to worry about anything moving. And then I put those all together. Um, mm -hmm. If you're new to night shooting, I highly recommend that you know where to find your aperture, shutter, and ISO, and your two-second timer before you go out shooting. Um, it just helps a lot for your own comfort um, to be able to find those things without having to turn a headlamp on. And if you are shooting next to somebody, you really don't want to have a headlamp on because then you might be wrecking their shot. So if you're not familiar with where to find all of those things, you can sit in a dark room and memorize where your buttons are. And it really helps with the flow um, when you're out there, you know, trying to shoot at night. The other one I would add here that isn't on the list is your playback and your magnification so that when you are doing some kind of focus stack, then you can see where things are in focus and where the focus falls off. Um, but it's really good to be able to navigate your camera in the dark. Okay, any questions right now? We have a few. Okay, I'll pause. Um, it's all about, um... Some people is asking, for example, uh, Daniel Forant and Alexander Shmugliakov. They ask if you're uh, using a, or ever use the Star Tracker device, device, device instead of um, um, stacking for the sky. Yeah, I using actually, Star Tracker. I do. Um, I do have a Star Tracker right now in the Rockies. It's been really, really cold. And by really cold, I mean, it's been like minus 50 cold. Um, at one night I was out at minus 50, lots of nights at minus 40 and um, like many, many, many more at minus 30, 35. So I don't like messing around with the star tracker um, <laughs> when it's cold outside, but it's, uh, you know, definitely something that I do and that I enjoy. And, but typically, even if I'm using the star tracker, I'm probably going to stack those for noise reduction anyway, okay. um, even though they're not noisy. But yeah, it's it's a cool tool to be able to use. Yeah, I'm not awesome. A class of star tracker, so it's nice to be able to know what you can do if you don't have that equipment too. Yeah, uh, star tracker is for another class, guys. <laughs> <laughs> another 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 whole master class. <laughs> yeah. Then you, we have Diego Abad. Um, you know that uh, for appeals, we always talk about the hyperfocal distance because we don't do that focus stacking. Uh, mm -hmm. What about hyperfocal distance instead of focus stacking? Well, uh, <laughs> hyperfocal distance, yeah. So, yes, but think about being out there at night. Um, you're shooting at your widest aperture, it's 2.8. So, that means you can use photo pills for this. Um, there is a, a the hyperfocal table or mm -hmm. yeah, subject distance hyperfocal table. So I have it right now here in front of me. So you would put in your camera and uh, and find your focal length. Let's say that we're shooting at 16 millimeters and f2.8. So our hyperfocal distance would be roughly 10 feet. But I like getting really low and close to my foreground. So yeah. I'm sometimes sitting like right on top of it. And I have an example, um, I haven't even edited it yet from yesterday morning's shoot, um, where I was, I had actually exceeded the camera's minimum focusing distance um, mm -hmm. because I was so close. Like my camera was like less than 12 inches away from my foreground. 
So in that case, you can't use hyperfocal distance. You really have to be able to do the focus stacking. Hyperfocal distance really only works if you're a good distance away from your subject. And yeah. obviously, you're, the greater your, your, or sorry, the wider your aperture, the greater that distance has to be. And I'm all about getting right in on my foreground. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's all about using the. Yeah, it's all about using the techniques that work for you for the result you want. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, it's it's good to know that you have all these different techniques you can use, but then you can choose. Uh, you need to choose the one that is uh, giving you the results you want. Yeah, we have another question. Man, lots of questions, I think, uh, from Pete Rassiti. Yeah. Do you take pictures gradually moving forward or back from the initial image, or do you take them at the close up? and far out and they balance out in the stacking? That is a great question. It's um, it's really important to work in in order, either back to front or front to back. Um, it doesn't matter which direction you move in. It's really about what's going on at, the, at, at that time. So let's take, for example, that we have an Aurora and I'm shooting images of the Aurora dancing. I am not going to take my focus off the background unless I absolutely need to, um, because I want to capture as much of that, that movement and everything that's going on. If there's something interesting in the sky, I'm always going to start in the background and then move forward. But if I'm waiting, like that shot that I just showed you that had a little bit of Aurora and a little bit of, um, of uh, light pollution on the other side, after the, the Aurora died off, I did my focus stack. And what I did was I used my headlamp to find my nearest focal point, And that was according to my camera, it said 0.8 of a millimeter. And then mm -hmm. I just turned the lens, the focal uh, wheel on the lens incrementally, many, 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 many times until I reached the background. And then I double checked that I had that background shot at 30 seconds and focus to infinity as well. Um, so in that case, I worked back to front, uh, or sorry, front to back. But in many cases, if there's something really interesting going on in the sky, I'll work back to front because I want to make sure that I get all of the shots of the sky that I need to. Does that make sense? Um, you yes. Can, you can do it in either way. You can do it in either direction. Um, but when you put them together in Photoshop or if you use Helicon Focus to, to do your focus stacking, the program needs to create a depth map. And it's a lot easier for the program to read the files if they are in order from either front to back or back to front. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Another question from Guy, Guy Care. Uh, when doing the focus stacking, do you take yeah. several uh, of the sky and run them through a starting landscape before combining in Photoshop? Yes. So when I align things in Photoshop, I do the starry landscape stacker first, and I get the single image for the sky. And then I do all of my foreground shots. So I have a single image, let's call it a TIFF of the sky. That's the 20 images stacked for noise reduction. And then I bring in all my foreground shots. I align those first. So there should be 21 shots there or whatever, however many between the, the foreground and that, that single image of the TIFF. Um, and I make sure that I align them before I do anything. And then when I focus stack, I turn off the layer that is the sky for the focus stack and I just do the, the foreground. So I don't know if that is super clear, but, um, I want to make sure everything is aligned, but I only want to mm -hmm. stack the foreground. Okay. So all images for alignment, only foreground for stacking. Perfecto. Uh, do you want to continue? We have a few okay. more questions, but yeah, let's continue okay. and then we'll All answer right. them. So um, I know that some of this looks really complicated um, and some of it is <laughs> kind of complicated, but not all images are the same. Um, so I have three sort of broad categories of images that I'll walk you through. Um, single images. <laughs> These don't happen very often, but they happen under certain conditions. Blends, which is 98.999% of my work. Mm -hmm. um, these are exposure blends, focus stacks, blue hour blends, any kind of blend, right? Uh, perspective blends and composites. Composites. So the difference between a blend and a composite for me is with a blend, I am taking all the photos in one place without moving my camera over a period of time. And the composite would be that I 
bring you know a sky from another area and I put it with a foreground from area B. So mm -hmm. um, they're very much this, the same in how they are put together in the techniques that we use in Photoshop, but they're just sort of different in that you take parts of the image in one place and parts of the image in another place. So a single image for me then is any time that I can get the whole image on a single plane of focus. And um, that worked in this particular shot because I had lots of moonlight to work with and I was able to take the whole shot at F8 for five seconds ISO 3200. Um, and at F8, I don't have to, and I'm you know a little bit of a distance from my, from my foreground element there. I didn't really have any any low close foreground. It was kind of a messy rocks and a little mm -hmm. bit of ice. Um, I looked for a reflection, but it didn't really work for me. So this shot was an easy single shot. This is actually taken as one single frame out of a time lapse. Mm -hmm. um, so it worked though, because I had enough moonlight that I could use a greater aperture. So I didn't have to shoot it at F2.8. At F2.8, if I had focused on those near ground rocks, the distant ones wouldn't have been in focus. Mm -hmm. right. Do you plan to have the moon uh, in your photos, like a moonlight? Yeah, so this particular night in Iceland, um, it was a big moon night, but we had a, a great aurora forecast. Mm -hmm. We actually drove like eight hours okay. to this one location and planned to shoot the aurora during moonlight because when you have really bright aurora or um, like a really high aurora forecast, uh, good KP levels, then it, the aurora can overcome the moonlight. So I don't shy away from shooting during moonlight. I actually love, love, love shooting in different types of moonlight. Mm -hmm. um, shooting the moon is much like shooting the sun. So when the moon is really high in the sky, the light is really blue and really harsh. When it's low mm -hmm. on the horizon, you get really soft light. Um, it tends to be warmer. And it's kind of like shooting golden hour from the sun. Um, and you can also get peak light on mountaintops and stuff like that with the rise and the set of the moon. So I love shooting moonlight. I never shy away from it, but I just have to adjust my expectations. Hmm. But it does actually make things kind of cool that you can shoot at F8 or F16 in the middle of the night because you have all that moonlight, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, my second category of shots is blends. Um, this one is both a focus stack and an exposure blend. I talked about it a little bit already. Um, it can be a challenge to do that, but I have to, I had to think about each part of the scene individually. So how do I need to photograph the sky to make sure that I don't have any movement of the stars? Um, when I was photographing the sky, the, the light here from the lodge was so bright for my F8 shot and it was reflecting off of this this um, mist that was on the water and it just made the whole foreground blown out. So I got one shot for the sky and then I had to adjust and do a different exposure for the lodge so that the light didn't blow out. And then I had to focus stack in here. So I do a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. This one is a perspective blend. So I had been, I had already been out shooting all night. Um, I was at a different location and on my way home, I saw this fog coming through the valley, which is yeah, like really special for a night shot, especially around here. We don't get a lot of fog in the wintertime. <clears throat> so um, I started shooting and I was shooting on my 21 millimeter Loxia. This is like such a ridiculously sharp lens. It's so much fun to work with. And then I shifted over with my second camera, just a few feet and I had my 18 millimeter lens on and I got this gorgeous, gorgeous foreground. So I'm out there in the middle of the night, you know, trying to find my, my composition. And the first one I thought was great. And then I saw this one and I was just like, holy wow, it's so beautiful. Um, but as I was shooting it, the fog disappeared. And so I ended up taking the shots from two feet over from my 21 millimeter Loxia. And I combined it with my 18 millimeter uh, that is foreground and you know it's really the same shot the stars were in the same place it was within a few minutes but um, the fog had disappeared so I did a perspective blend there so it's a blend of two different focal lengths and of course it's focus stack <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, the last category I have is composites. They really do come together just like uh, just like a blend. Um, this example here with this cactus and the Milky Way behind it. Um, I found this pile of rocks with a cool cactus and it looked like the perfect shape for, you know, the opening for Milky Way. So, but the Milky Way didn't line up there. Um, I typically won't do a composite with a Milky Way for an iconic location, like, you know, any of our big peaks in the Canadian Rockies, for example. Um, I really try to be true to what is there, but something like this, like this little indiscriminate pile of rocks with, with a cactus in front of it, um, it's a fun chance to create something that, that doesn't exist. Um, so this blue hour shot here is also focus stacked, but it's shot at F11. I'm really close to that cactus, like I'm inches away from it. Uh, ISO 100 for 30 seconds. And when I do my blue hour shots, um, my exposure meter is reading zero. Um, so this is sort of the ideal settings that I aim for. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. But the whole idea with blue hour is that you're shooting at a time of day when you um, don't have any directional light from the sun. And again, photo pills can help with this because you know, it lists out all of your times for shooting from nautical, sorry, astro twilight, nighttime, nautical twilight, blue hour, golden hour, sunrise, you know, goes through the whole day. And so it's really easy to plan how, how and when you're gonna do these kinds of shots. So this is the sky that I used to put together with that. And um, so I, I used photo pills to determine my shutter for accurate stars. Um, and I'm shooting wide open here. I adjusted the ISO. So typically when I'm doing super short shutters, my ISO is some, somewhere above 10,000. Depends on how much light I have though. And then you need to take a minimum of seven sequential images. I took 20 <laughs> <laughs> and then I used Starry Landscape Stacker to put them together. And the result is that. It's kind of beautiful. Fun. Thanks. All right, any questions right now? We have a few. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, Romain Bayliss, how do you set your Y balance? Ah, uh, that is a whole, that's a whole thing. It's a whole talk. Um, okay. I, but I love, I love the question. So the night sky is, you get different sort of tones in the night sky, depending on where you are in the world and where you're shooting. Um, up here in the Rockies, I find that if I set my Kelvin temperature to 4,300 Kelvin, I usually get good color separation in my image. So mm -hmm. when I talk about color separation, I mean, I can actually see that, you know, maybe in that Aurora example that I showed you guys earlier, that I have a little bit of green on one side, a little bit of warmth on the other side, and I still have, you know, blues in the sky. If the white balance is set to, let's say incandescent on a Sony. I don't know if you have any Sony shooters in the audience, but incandescent is a super blue white balance. And it just kind of looks like the camera got sick and everything in the image turned blue. So I try to find a white balance that's going to give me really good color separation. Um, in California, I find that when I'm shooting there, I get a lot of air glow and it's really green and it's just totally different than what I get in the Rockies. So I have to adjust the Kelvin to pick up all the different colors that are in it. Mm -hmm. um, but a good starting place for me here in the Rockies is that 4,300 Kelvin. Um, it also depends on what time of night I shoot. When I'm shooting twilight shots, my Kelvin temperature is warmer. It could be set to shade even, um, depending on what the, what the twilight light looks like. Um, just because that helps me to pick up the colors of twilight. So I often get pinks and yellows and stuff like that. Um, so warmer white balances earlier in the evening before it's true nighttime. So if you're looking at um, astro uh, astronomical twilight, that's usually a warmer white balance for me. And then once it's true nighttime, I'll choose something cooler like 4,300 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So you're, uh, you're setting the white balance in camera. Always, yeah. Um, I find that you know sometimes you can get there in post if you're if you've shot in some really weird white balance, but you can get color cast and it can be hard to get the best result. So I always try to do it in the field. I think it's um, 
it's even harder and more important to get the, the white balance um, in camera when you're shooting night stuff than it is day stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I find daytime, it's just super easy to correct. You're never really that far off, even if you're using auto settings. But nighttime to get that color separation, um, I think I think you got to find it when you're out in the fields. Yeah, you got a point there. Awesome. Another question from Tamilaf25. If you take a couple of shots on high ISO, but there is a lot of light pollution, how do you overcome this? So I want to make sure that um, that the light pollution doesn't overpower the stars. So I have to take that into consideration. It might mean that I have to choose a lower um, a lower ISO. Um, yeah, it's one of those situationally dependent questions. You know, it's hard to imagine until you're there, but you have to adjust to make sure that you don't blow out the stars if you have that light pollution. Okay, okay. And now we have um, a question. Yep. What, I'll just follow that up with saying that there is filters you can get. Um, this one is by Hoya. It's mm -hmm. an intensifier filter, and it can cut some of the, the wavelengths of light that come from light pollution. So you might find something like this helpful if you have to shoot in, a, in an area that has a lot of light pollution. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, we, we, we also use one. I think we were using the one by Ian Norman, the Pure Night. Mm -hmm. uh, filter, which is cool too. Okay, we have a question from uh, Bruce Leonard, our friend. <laughs> Bruce, my favorite human. <laughs> when com uh, compositing, when compositing uh, an image, do you combine different focal lengths or use a longer focal length for the stars? Sometimes, um, if it if it works, um, I do like doing that. I think. Longer focal lengths for the stars make the stars really pop out and really fill the image. Um, and it just depends, I guess, on the location, but it's a fun thing to do. So I guess the short answer is yes. <laughs> awesome. And the last question from Chris Cardos. Uh, when you shoot 20 shots, do you use continuous shooting mode or do you slow things down space the shots to reduce vibration, maybe use mirror roll cup? Uh, great question. Um, so I typically use the interval shooting on my Sony camera. Um, if you don't have interval shooting on your camera, you can also uh, just use a remote trigger. But when you're doing the 20 shots, you want the interval between the shots to be equal. And that's gonna help the algorithm calculate where the stars are going to be as you move through the different shots because the, the stars are constantly moving. So um, it actually moves quite a bit between shot one and shot 20. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I use the interval shooting. I do a one second interval. Mm -hmm. um, my camera and my memory cards are fast enough that it can record that image um, and move on to the next one within a second. Um, especially when it's cold, I don't feel the need to wait any longer than that. <laughs> as long as the camera can keep up, then that's fine. If your camera is a little bit slower um, or if your memory card is slow, you might need to give it a little bit of extra time, maybe two seconds in between. Um, and just the idea being that it just needs, the camera needs time to write that information to your memory card before it takes the next shot. Um, so equal intervals are really, really important for the algorithm to be able to figure out how the stars align and how to reduce the noise. Um, but you can do it with a remote trigger. You don't have to have interval shooting. Um, you just have to set it up that way. So um, yeah, typically I also recommend uh, your two second timer so that, because when you're taking a long exposure on a tripod, if you press the shutter and the camera shoots immediately and you take your finger away, then you can actually introduce like shutter shake or or shock into your long exposure that might make things less, you know, less crisp. You might get some blur or some movement. So even when I'm doing interval shooting, I start with a one or two second um, time, you know, before I, from the time that I press the trigger until the time that I, that it starts shooting is usually two seconds. And then there's one second in between the shots. Fantastic, thank you, Rachel. Okay. Let's move on. Okay. So this hey, is the exciting part, which is the planning. <laughs> you do so much planning. It's a little bit, it's, it's borderline excessive. 
Um, but I feel like planning is what's going to get me the, the absolutely best results. So like I said earlier, I would rather have photo pills than my headlamps. So um, <laughs> that gives you any, any indication of how much I rely on photo pills. Uh, so, you know, at a most basic level, I can look at photo pills and find my window for, let's say, shooting the night sky. Um, maybe I want to do the Milky Way or maybe I want to shoot Orion or it doesn't really matter, but I want to find my darkest nights. I can use the moon calendar to figure out where my dark nights are. And from there, I can get into the nitty gritty of planning, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I can use the planner. And today I actually wanna walk you through a shot that I did yesterday morning. I haven't had a chance to edit it, but I'm gonna show you my raw files, which is a little bit like a magician showing you their tricks. Um, but I wanted to show you what that looks like when I actually go through the whole planning for something. Mm -hmm. um, so I was planning a shoot at one of my favorite peaks in Jasper National Park. Um, I was there last year and um, this, this shot on the right is using photo pills, the night AR. I was able to see the exact alignment of the Milky Way when I was on location. But um, this being my first time out there this year, and it's much, much earlier, I knew that the um, alignment was gonna look a little bit different um, just because of the early time. So uh, I pulled up my location and I actually was able to drop a pin where I typically stand to take that mm -hmm. shot at that mm -hmm. location. And from there, I can see that the Milky Way core which is, so this line is the Milky Way and the bigger bubbles are the core. I could see that it was basically touching the top of the mountain. It wasn't reaching over as far as I got to see it in May. So this is the core over here. Um, so I knew that um, it was at most, at the very, very latest I could shoot, the Milky Way was gonna kind of sit or come out of the top of the mountain there. Um, up here at the top of the screen, you can see what time the Milky Way appears here. And it's going to be 4.23 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the core visibility is going to disappear at 5.22 a.m. So this was actually a little bit of an investment for me to go and do this shoot. Uh, the next thing I need to do is check the weather. Mm -hmm. So I use an app called Windy a lot. I really rely on this one, um, second only probably to photo pills. And, um, what I really love about it is that you can kind of look at sort of the big picture of the weather. So um, I just did this little screen recording this morning and this is actually the weather here for uh, looking at tomorrow. So you can see all these little places where I have hearts. This is my favorite shooting locations in the Rocky Mountains. And uh, the weather is looking awfully clear for morning. So you know where I'm gonna be um, it's not going to be in my bed at four o'clock in the morning. Um, so the night that I did my shoot, I again used photo pills, um, or sorry, photo pills and windy. With mm -hmm. windy, you get two different um, weather forecasts. Uh, here in the mountains, the top two are the best ones, um, the ECMWF and the GFS, and they often have different predictions. So um, I use I use other websites as tiebreakers sometimes. Um, but when I was planning my shoot out to Jasper, I looked, um, these two hearts here are my location and they both looked like they were gonna be very, very clear. These little lines here are wind. Wind was not really a factor for me. Um, so I was just looking at the clear sky. And so four o'clock in the morning when I was expecting the Milky Way to, to rise within the next few minutes, um, I had clear skies. I checked two more <laughs> weather forecasts. <laughs> um, one is mountainweather.com because our, you know, the weather in the mountains is a little less predictable um, than it is in more open areas. And that's because the, wet, the mountains create their own little microclimates. And um, it's funny because I know the, the different areas and I know where I'm more likely to get cloud and where it's more rare to get clear skies and whatnot. So I like the, I like the tiebreaker apps. Um, this one confirmed uh, this mountainweather.com that I was definitely going to have uh, clear skies. Uh, this one also has the temperature. It said that I was uh, that it was going to be about minus nine as a as a low, um, and that was at an elevation of 1,500 meters, 
When we got there though, it was actually minus 23. Um, according to the thermometer in my car. So it was significantly colder, but minus 23 is excellent conditions for frost flowers. So we got frost flowers. And then my other weather here is, this is just another website. It's called cleardarksky.com. And it's a different kind of graph, but it shows you what you can expect in terms of visibility. And so I found the nearest point to where I was gonna shoot was the Athabasca Glacier and I had nice clear skies. So I'm basically guaranteed clear skies here, guys. And um, that sometimes still works out to be very disappointing, but it wasn't disappointing yesterday. I got, I got incredible conditions. It was a two hour and 31 minute drive from my oh. home in Canmore. And I had a friend with me and she had to catch a flight at 10 a.m. from Calgary. So it was two hours and 31 minutes to location, and it was three hours and 44 minutes back to Calgary for her to catch her flight. Um, and we've already we've already discovered that the Milky Way was visible at about 4.20 in the morning. Um, I like to get to location an hour early so that I can scout my composition in the dark. So um, that means that I had to plan to be there at no later than than 3, 3.30 in the morning. So I went with three o'clock. And that meant leaving my house no later than 12.30 p.m. And I actually left at midnight. So I left at midnight, drove to location. We had an hour and a half to find her composition, which was really good because we needed all of that time. And um, yeah, so when I, get the there, <laughs> when I get there, I'm now wandering around in the dark with a headlamp, hopefully, or just photo pills. And, um, and I'm trying to find a composition. So on a Sony camera, um, we're really lucky. We have a feature called bright monitoring. I don't know if you guys um, have ever used this, but I wanted to introduce it to you anyway, because it really helps you to find a composition quickly and easily at night. So basically what's going on when you have bright monitoring, you have to set it up to a custom button. Um, so for me, um, working in the winter time and in the cold with gloves on, I want that custom button to be something I can feel um, with my gloves. So I have it set to the C2 on my camera. But basically what happens when you turn on bright monitoring is that the camera boosts the gain internally of, of the light so that you can actually see your composition. So mm -hmm. this is a shaky handheld um, phone video of me turning bright monitoring on when I was in Iceland last year trying to find a composition in the middle of the night because the aurora was kicking off. And um, so you can see here, that's what the back of my camera looked like before I turned on bright monitoring. And then when I turn it on, I can actually see all the details in the frost flowers and everything that was going on there. So it allows me to find my composition so quick and easy. The only time that it's not really helpful is basically when you have like an absolutely pitch dark night, new moon, no, no aurora, no moon, no, no, no light to speak of, and you're just out under the stars, which was basically yesterday morning. Um, but bright monitoring still helped me yesterday morning. It's a little bit more limited um, in the darker corners of the frame, so um, it does have to be set up to a custom button. Um, this is just what it looks like on the back of a Sony camera. Um, the function is called bright monitoring, which is different than monitor brightness. Um, but highly, highly, highly recommended for Sony shooters who are going out in the dark. So I arrived yesterday. I got there nice and early. I was looking for my location or, you know, scouting my composition using bright monitoring. And my next step was to figure out what the shutter time needed to be for my particular camera. Um, I have been absolutely in love with the Sony a7S III. I've been shooting on it um, for the last three weeks. It's a low light, absolute beast of a camera. It just handles low light situations so, so well and handles you know, high ISOs really well, uh, really well as well. <laughs> and, um, and I have the 12 to 24 millimeter lens, which I basically haven't taken off the camera because I'm also obsessed with that. It's super, super sharp. So when I, when I use photo pills and I go into spot stars, um, with the Sony a7S III. My default setting at f2.8 for 12 millimeters is 27 seconds. And mm -hmm. um, my accurate setting is 13.67 seconds. And sometimes, you know, for a camera like the a7S uh, III, I can actually go below that and still get a really nice exposure. 
Um, about 13 seconds would be my outside for getting nice sharp stars. Okay, so now I just want to do a little sidebar here and show you guys the actual photos that I took. They're not edited. So um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like when I go out in the field. Um, so what I'm going to do is turn on this. And so I spend a lot of time finding compositions. I took a bunch of test shots yesterday. I know that these are probably a little bit dark for you to see, but this composition is gross. Um, so is this, <laughs> it's really messy, but you can see that this, oh, and that's blurry. I guess I kicked the tripod. Um, also gross. Oh, getting better, <laughs> getting better. So I found this little hole that I wanted to work with. Um, I know these images are probably a little bit dark, um, but I can show you, I started the processing. So this is um, my blue hour. They're not actually blue hour shots. They're astronomical twilight because my friend had to be at the airport and I had to leave at 6 a.m., which is before blue hour. So I was shooting in astro twilight, trying to focus stack. And I have and like, I don't know, 30 shots or something like that that I took. I don't know if I need all 30, but I definitely worked through the scene with all 30. So what's great about this is I got these gorgeous little frost flowers here in the foreground. Um, and I can show you when I punch in here. I actually exceeded the minimum focus distance with the camera. So this bottom bit here is out of focus, which is OK because I framed it in such a way that I can crop the image a little bit smaller. Um, what I really wanted was to make sure that I got this nice outside edge here, all these details, the frost flowers, the reflection of the peak in the, in the little bit of water. And the stars actually reflect in here too, um, not on these bright shots, but on the darker shots. So um, that's- Fantastic image. Uh, yeah, do you scout always in the uh, nighttime? What's that? <laughs> Sorry? I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to, I think I have a bit of echo. Oh, it sounds pretty good to me. Yes? Yeah. Okay, uh, do you scout at night always or do you also scout find your compositions in daytime? I absolutely prefer to scout in the daytime, but right now what that would mean for me would be going the day before. And because this was such a long drive, um, I didn't want to go the day before. Um, mm -hmm. Also, when things are cold, like minus 23, we get different, um, you know, the, the foreground is going to change quite a bit because we get frost flowers and stuff like that when the, when the temperatures drop. So it's funny, I can actually show you that even though I barely moved, watch that foreground really, really closely mm -hmm. um, when I flip through these images because, so I didn't move um, and the, the time between these shots is about 30 to 35 seconds and the frost flowers actually start to change because the sun is coming up. Oh. So let's see if I can show you this. Yeah, anyway, so the short answer is I totally prefer to scout during the day, um, but sometimes that doesn't work out for me. And wait for it, it's coming, it's coming. You can just see like little little tiny changes. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that's gonna be interesting for the focus stacking. Yeah, well, I'll have to put them all together. So you'll have to just wait and see when I, <laughs> when I finally get them together. But yeah, the, the foreground definitely changed. So the sky here, um, remember I told you that at the latest, so before the astro twilight, the Milky Way, according to PhotoPills, was going to line up with the top of the mountain. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, look at that. So the Milky Way basically lines up exactly with the top of the mountain here. I'm going to open this raw file so you can see and just make it a little bit brighter. So there's the Milky Way just shooting out of the top of the mountain, just like photo pills. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's like made magic. It's yeah. so cool. <laughs> nice photo, right? nice composition. I mean, finding compositions in the dark, it's tough. Yeah, it is really, really tough. And, um, you know, this is a location I'm familiar with. So it's, mm -hmm. I kind of, I know where to go within, yeah. you know, within a certain small area. I know what to expect. I kind of know what I'm looking for. I've I've done it like, you know, I've shot there a gazillion times. Um, 
people who are local kind of joke that it's my mountain because <laughs> there's so much, um, which I'm totally okay with. I love having a mountain that's my very own. Um, yeah, and it's just a, you know, it's a beautiful time of, of, of year. So it's not my favorite mountain in the summer. It's only my favorite mountain in the winter. But um, so it's a little easier when you, when you know what to expect, um, which I don't always, but I definitely did in this situation. Um, and it's still, you know, then you get there and it's a really dark night. So bright monitoring helps. It can help me to center the, the mountain peak. I could see that. I could see where the opening in, in the water was so I could center my, my photo and whatnot. Um, I actually did take a test shot to see if I had exceeded that minimum focus distance. And in the dark, I'm like, oh, I can see the top of the frost flowers. So I knew that I was on the borderline. Um, but even, you know, just taking a picture in absolute darkness, high ISO 30 seconds, it was still hard to see what was cut off on the bottom until I had a little bit more light. Um, but yeah, it's just the time of night right now requires that you get up so early. And um, I've been doing a lot of night shooting. So for Raphael, I, we had a little meeting two days ago and when he saw me, I'd only had like three hours of sleep in two days. So I was a little bit cross-eyed, call it pirate eye, because I can't like can't even keep one eye open. Um, and then it just got worse from there because I did this shoot the other night and then I slept for a solid 15 hours yesterday. So doing awesome today. But sleeping is good. Sleeping is good. Yeah, sleeping is great. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So the whole scouting in the daytime, I would absolutely love to do that. But when you're that would have meant scouting in the daytime, driving out there yeah. the day before and sleeping for six hours or eight hours in the car, <laughs> which doesn't always work. And then getting out and shooting, it just makes things a little harder on the body. So when necessary, use bright monitoring to find a composition during the day. I mean, I mean and at night is great. It's great to be to scout. Uh, do you have time for another question, a few questions? Yeah, yeah, a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. Eamon Cullen, does Rachel use a dummy battery with an external pack to keep her batteries alive in super cold temperatures? What's your trick for battery problems? Love that question. Okay, so I have a little story for you, if you have patience for a story. So Polar Vortex, we were shooting in some pretty cold conditions. I had two ladies who were local from the Calgary area. Um, I hope you're watching today, uh, Diana and Terry. Um, but so we had decided to get together to do an astro shoot um we drove from emerald lake lodge down to this location which is again about two and two two and a half hours and the forecast for these brave ladies was minus 33 celsius <laughs> but we got there and the temperature in my vehicle actually registered minus 40 and it was cold like i mean it was really cold i've been out at minus 40 before and it was like I was just shocked at how cold it was for minus 40. So we get out there and we try and we're, we're attempting this shoot anyway. So this is getting to your battery question. I took a fresh battery out of my jacket, put it in the camera and it said battery exhausted. It was really cold. The batteries basically withered and died in the time that it took to get from my pocket to the camera. We actually did successfully get that shoot in that morning. And I think these ladies are absolute rock stars. But there's a second part to that story. So two days later, I decided to go out. I was on my own and I went to uh, one of my other favorite spots. And again, get there and the, the vehicle said I was at minus 40. And I'm like, oh, it's minus 40 again, you know? And so I'm prepared for the battery issue and everything. But I get out there and my batteries actually lasted two and a half hours. And I was like, wow, this is my, my very not so bright moment. But I was like, wow. This minus 40 is way warmer than the other minus 40 from two days ago. It was just like a really stupid moment. Okay, guys, it was really, really early in the morning. And yeah, anyway, so I was talking to my sister later that day and I was telling her this about like how it was like warmer at one place, it, like it felt warmer and the batteries lasted longer. And she's like, Rach, you do realize that vehicles the temperature gauge in a vehicle, it only goes to minus 40 in most vehicles, right? I was like, oh, right. <laughs> so, so actually the temperature with these ladies, it, I think it was closer to minus 50 that day because it was like 
they were recording temperatures of minus 45 plus wind chill and you know stuff like that so those ladies were out there in minus 50 and i can tell you at minus 50 basically you can't that you can barely move the buttons i'm surprised that anything worked at all because our cameras were like blocks of ice wow. um i was shooting on the sony a7s3 one of the ladies was shooting on the Sony A92 and the other one was shooting on the Sony A7R3. And we found this one little patch of foreground and the three cameras were huddled around there. And we're only, I have to say that we're only like just across the street from the car. Had we been any further from the vehicle, this wouldn't have worked because it was just too cold, like exposure and risk of frostbite and all that kind of stuff is way too big of a concern. So the whole battery thing, I can tell you at minus 50, the batteries basically don't work. They die before you get them in the camera and it doesn't matter if you put them in a pocket or not. At minus, uh, at warmer minus 40, so somewhere that's <laughs> actually nearer to minus 40, um, the batteries in the camera lasted for about two and a half hours. And that's the Z battery in the Mark III line of the Sony camera. They're, they're a pretty good sized battery. And mm -hmm. I've shot at minus 20, did time lapse and the battery lasted for six hours and took over 1800 frames. So yeah. temperature definitely affects them. And um, one of the ways that I, you know, if it's really cold, like beyond my, below minus 30 Celsius, I'll put batteries in my pocket and try and keep them warm. I put chemical warmers in there with them sometimes just to have a little extra heat mm -hmm. because as soon as the batteries get cold, they, you know, they really struggle. So, but the cameras did good. You know, the cameras still shot wow. at minus 50. Everything was slow. Like I was looking, I was pressed the, the, the shutter and then the, the LCD screen would sort of like kind of fade in <laughs> and fade out, you know, like, do I really have to do this? And I'm like, if I have to be here, you have to be here. So it's a whole yeah. conversation with the camera. Yeah. So cool, so, so cool. Yeah. Uh, Brian McCracken, McCracken is asking, do you use heated gloves? Ah, I don't use heated gloves, but I do have the world's best gloves made by the heat company. And I will show you those right now. Um, these are, they're so warm. Um, that's these. So they have, there's two different styles. One is like the outer mitten and then you buy the liner separately. And then another style, the liner is built into the mitten. But basically these are so good for photographers because um, the liner glove is thin enough that you can feel all the buttons and you can press all the buttons and you can still operate a camera at minus 50. Mm -hmm. If you touch a camera or a tripod anywhere below like minus, minus 20, you can actually get burned, you know, from the cold frostbite or, or frost nip from touching the cold camera body mm -hmm. and stuff. So you never want to take your gloves off if it's cold. Um, these gloves are not heated, but what they allow you to do is because they have this outer mitten and they have these little pockets in them, you can undo the pocket or you can do the un unzip them and put chemical warmers in there. And so you can get a chemical warmer in the top part of your hand. And then I slide another one down between uh, around the inside of the glove. And when I'm done shooting, I can curl my fingers around it. And that helps immensely at cold, cold temperatures. Um, the other thing that I use and um, the heat company who makes these gloves, they also make the chemical warmers as well. Um, but I use the insole ones for my feet and then I have toe warmers as well. So I get the insole ones cover the whole bottom of the boot and then the toe warmers I can put on the top of my sock. They're like adhesive. Mm -hmm. And so then I have like a little sandwich of warmth around my feet. So that's what really saves me when it's cold. Those gloves are basically required highly suggested gear for anybody who does a winter Rockies trip with me. Um, they're just really, really good. Uh, great. Then we have Carl uh, Boislard Lanois. Uh, yeah. He's asking if do you use any lens warmer? Uh, like a... Yeah, I haven't used a lens warmer. I have heard of them. Um, I would be totally interested in trying one if somebody had a suggestion for a good one. Um, I typically don't get frost on my lens, even though my camera has frosted up before. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This is just an iPhone picture, but <laughs> I had left my camera out to time lapse and it like got frost flowers on it. But actually the front element of the lens didn't frost over. So the only time that I've had that happen to me is um, 
when I'm really low and close to the water in really, really cold conditions. Um, and also the flatter the lens, the more likely the frost is going to adhere to it. This um, convex shape of the 12 to 24, it really didn't frost over. So mm -hmm. I had two cameras running yesterday morning. One was my 16 to 35 and the other one was the 12 to 24. The 12 to 24 was way closer to the water and um, and never got any frost on it in the three hours that I was shooting. And the 16 to 35 just started to get little crystals here and there, um, but it's a flatter front element. And I think that might've contributed. So yeah, I haven't tried them. I think they're worth, they're definitely worth trying, especially if you live in a in like a high moisture area. Um, mm -hmm. So if anyone has any recommendations, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a couple, a couple of friends about uh, lens fogging. Uh, okay. How do you prevent from from lens fogging? Okay. Like... Um, so that yeah, I mean that does happen. So it happens most when you come from like let's say I'm out shooting in the cold, and I come into a warmer environment. It could be my vehicle. Um, I really try to leave my camera in my bag. Your bag, your camera bag, is a natural dehumidifier. Mm -hmm. So you want to avoid those really abrupt temperature changes. And um, when I'm shooting in the winter time, I actually leave my bag in the very back of my vehicle because that's the coldest. I've got the heat just blasting in the front so that I can try and be warm. Um, so I always leave my camera equipment in the back. When you get lens fog, you know, depending on what kind of conditions you're shooting in, um, sometimes you can just wipe it and, and it'll just, the fog will come right back. Um, but it's better to try and avoid it where possible and avoiding it has to do with, you know, not, not moving between those abrupt temperature changes, um, with your camera mm -hmm. unprotected. So keep it in the bag. And that awesome. Helps. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, no problem. Any others? Uh, nope. Okay, cool. Do you guys want to hear about Aurora shooting? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, at least we have a uh, hundred people with us now. So, okay, all right. So, um, like I said, um, I have seen seasoned night photographers lose their minds as soon as the aurora kicks off. It's such a, a highly anticipated event that, and it's so overwhelming and so beautiful that when it happens, it's easy to kind of forget what's going on. So, my my approach to it is. Be there early if you can and find a composition. Um, uh, this particular shot, I wasn't able to be there in the daytime. Um, my aurora forecast, this is in Iceland, um, it showed that the clearest skies were gonna be over like the Diamond Beach area that night. And um, I did go there early and I scouted my composition, but I was at the beach, so the, my composition moved. <laughs> um, and then it was also inundated with with other people who night sky lovers with iphones and headlamps and car lights and it was just it was like a disco um more than just the aurora where so many lights and um eventually the clouds moved in and you know we were thinking about packing it in and then we found that there was another little opening over vesterhorn mountain which is what this is so we arrive in the middle of the night, it's one or two o'clock in the morning and the Aurora is absolutely kicking off. And, and here we stumble upon the Black Sand Beach had um, all these crazy huge ice formations. Um, some of these were the size of serving trays, like really, really massive. Uh, I've never seen anything that big or that beautiful. So, um, finding a composition in the middle of the night and having the aurora dancing and everything it's a really high pressure situation <laughs> so when i set up to do that to shoot the aurora i first of all you know i find my composition and i get focused on a star um, that gets me to focus on, um, at infinity mm -hmm. um, and then i start with the settings recommended by photophils for sharp stars so i would <laughs> use the accurate settings for my camera and my lens and uh, this night I had three cameras on the go. So yeah, I had different cameras, different lenses. Um, I had an A9, an R3 and an A7S, like the, the OG A7S. 
and they all had different lenses. Um, so it was really fun to shoot uh, all the different, you know, and each camera is different. So I was able to, to adjust the settings. So you want to start with basically sharp stars. If your stars are moving and you have this great Aurora, your, your shot is still, you know, you have room for improvement, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so start with what is going to give you sharp stars and then work your way down from there. So probably when we're thinking about the sky, we're going to be shooting at wide open apertures and we want to start with our, you know, typical sharp star settings. So on my A7S III at 12 millimeters, that's 13 seconds. But 13 seconds is pretty long if you have Aurora dancing in your shot. Um, if I was shooting on my 24 millimeter 1.4 on my Sony A7R III, the recommended time for that, the accurate settings is actually 3.67 seconds or 3.2 seconds when you round down. Um, and that's a really short shutter time. So this is totally dependent on your camera and your lens that you're using. Um, but you want to think about the fact that the Aurora is moving. So, yeah. you know, even if I can shoot at 13 seconds, do I want to shoot at 13 seconds? Like that's the, that's the maximum exposure time for the stars. But if the Aurora is dancing all over the place, then I might need to reduce the shutter. So I'm shooting wide open and I start with my setting for the stars and I adjust if the Aurora is dancing. And then the only thing I have left to, to adjust is my ISO and shooting Aurora. I don't do that stacking for noise reduction because the Aurora moves too much. Typically I have done it, but that's only when the Aurora is more like a, a glow on the horizon. And, um, but if it's moving, then I want, I want these to be basically like single images. I don't want to do a whole bunch of fancy noise reduction on them. So I try to keep my ISO some, somewhere around 3,200 or 4,000 or something like that. That's a preference. Um, I think you can do a pretty good noise reduction at ISO 6,400, but honestly, if the Aurora is really kicking off, um, you're going to be shooting at really short shutters and really low ISO anyway, because there's so much light. When the Aurora is really strong, there's actually enough light to stimulate the photoreceptors in our eyes that perceive color. So typically at night, we there's not enough light to stimulate those photoreceptors so that we see in black and white and we can see movement really well, but we don't see color. So it really takes uh, like a big aurora storm for us to be able to see the greens and the pinks that go in there. And, uh, and that does happen when the aurora is, is really dancing. And it's at those times when it's really dancing that we need to adjust our, our uh, shutter times lower and mm -hmm. our ISO is lower so we don't blow out the aurora. Um, so I always start for the stars and then I work on my foreground. So in this particular example, again, I had a full moon. So I was able to focus stack this at F8, which is mm -hmm. amazing. Like the image quality is just amazing. <laughs> and so each second was F8, 30 seconds and ISO 3200. And then my stars were a single shot at f2.8 for six seconds ISO 3200. And it wasn't even a super strong storm that night, but I had the foreground that just made the image really, really cool. It's a beautiful image. Thank you. So for Aurora planning, I have a couple different apps that I like to use. Um, one is super easy, and I think most people really enjoy it, even if you don't really know the science behind Aurora shooting or what causes the Aurora. Um, this one's called My Aurora Forecast. And it's just pretty handy because you know it'll show you um, what the current KP index is, although it does measure the KP index a little bit high. And it'll tell you with little red bars if you're approaching storm levels and what the probability of, <laughs> probability of seeing mm -hmm. the Aurora is in your particular area based on the cloud cover. So it takes that into account. This one is like, if you're new to Aurora shooting, definitely get this one. Um, if you have a little bit of experience or you're nerdy about the science like I am, then Space Weather Live is a really, really good tool. Um, Space Weather Live actually is where most apps get their data from, um, or it's one of the sources that they get their data from. And basically it shows you what your current um, conditions are and the long-term forecast. But you can also get super nerdy and look at the individual um, indicators. So your solar wind speed and um, interplanetary magnetic field and stuff like that. Wow. And when you 
when you know that stuff, then you can also see if the aurora is gonna is likely to happen in the next sort of 30 minutes to an hour kind of thing. So I really like Space Weather Live. Um, here's some screenshots from Space Weather Live. Um, this last one here is actually our current long-term forecast of the auroras, aurora. So um, March 18th and 19th, we're going to likely see KP5 conditions. Um, KP5, uh, that index is just a measure of the storm strength, basically. And if you're up under the aurora oval, like in the northern latitudes, Iceland and Norway and whatnot, a KP2 can be a really good storm. And you can see some really beautiful lights dancing, but here you wouldn't even see it. It's too far north. Um, here we kind of see a nice glow on the horizon at KP4. And at KP5, then we start seeing pillars and maybe a little bit of dancing. Um, so KP5 is a really nice storm. Uh, I definitely am watching the Aurora data like a hawk when we get KP5 conditions. So um, yeah, it gives you uh, this particular um, Space Weather Live will give you, you know, your current conditions, your probability of seeing the Aurora, and then you can actually look at the individual data, which is really awesome. Um, and so I was, this is basically KP4 conditions right here. Um, just a nice low glow on the horizon. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, for anybody who's interested, I'm doing a, a, an Aurora and Milky Way chase coming up on the 18th and 19th of March. Um, you can see more details on my website, but um, hoping for some really clear skies and um, some Milky Way shooting and some Aurora shooting because we have uh, the long term forecast with space weather is that we'll have KP5 conditions. So I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, awesome. Do you do, you do a lot of workshops around the year? I do. Um, most of my workshops are planned really well in advance and um, I do workshops in Scotland and Iceland. Um, I would do workshops, tons of workshops here in the Canadian Rockies. Um, this one that I just showed you is, is one that I only offer when the conditions are right. And so it's usually short notice, yeah. um, you know, two weeks, three weeks in advance, maybe, um, because it's just very situational. Um, but yeah, so I've done a lot of online workshops as well. In fact, the class that we, or sorry, the sort of presentation that we have today is the first or part of the first class that I offer for a 10 day online workshop. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I teach all of this stuff in even more detail than what you guys get to see here. So, yeah, I saw that, uh, give me more, more details about this because it's, it's a long program, right? Huh? Yeah, it's, it runs for 10 days. Um, so I do 90 minutes of classes every day. Um, and in the classes, we, you know, we start with some of the challenges with night photography, like I, like we talked about today. Um, we expand on that. And then we talk about shooting in different kinds of conditions um, and how to plan for those. So shooting in moonlight, shooting in twilight, mm -hmm. um, running through settings, running through just really everything that you can possibly imagine, the planning, the prep, the gear, um, so I have 10 classes that are sort of, you know, classes that I've taught before. And then I work with people one-on-one -on -one as well. So they get, um, you know, hours of just one-on-one -on -one time with me and to go over their own photos or their own challenges. So if they get a chance to go out and shoot, then um, then they get to get feedback from me on their, on their shoot and kind of where things went well and where things went wrong. We do tons of editing. So um, even with the editing, some people aren't able to get out and shoot right now with all of our restrictions. So I share my raw files and we'll run through the, I'll run through how I edit them and then I mm -hmm. give them the raw files and then they get to edit those uh, for themselves. So it's a really full program um, that covers like literally everything from A to Z, every different type of light at night and how to shoot it, the infield stuff, infield examples. Mm -hmm. um, raw files, everything. So really, it's quite quite a good uh, full program. Yeah, it <laughs> looks, it looks so amazing. I mean, it looks uh, it looks great, and one of the most important parts I believe is that people is getting feedback from you. Yeah, um, I 
I don't do um, the sort of canned video classes very much. I think it's more important to have that um, back and forth and being able to ask questions. And the more people ask questions, the more I can actually tailor the course to their, you know, what they what they're needing or what they need to understand. So I'm actually running one right now. And the other day we were talking about focusing at night and, you know, how I will find my nearest focal point and then move the lens, just you know, move the focal wheel just a little bit and then take a shot and then move it a little bit more. And they weren't really grasping it. So I actually went out and shot a video of me focusing at night so they could see exactly how I do it and exactly how I made those decisions. And so getting that feedback is helpful for me and it's helpful for them because I can, I can tailor things to what they need to, what they need to learn. And uh, I keep my groups pretty small right now. I have a group of 10, uh, which mm -hmm. is big, big group for me. Um, and sometimes it's the smallest, like two to four. So there's lots smallest. of, lots of interaction there. And, uh, I, I get to cover more in an online class than I actually do when we're in the field, because when I'm doing online classes, I get to cover everything. And when we're in the yeah. field, it's more situationally dependent. You know, what are we going to what are we going to cover with this light at this location? And um, yeah, I think the online class is a really um, uh, thorough <laughs> night, night shooting. So. Yeah, it sounds awesome. Uh, people, you want to learn fast? Go <laughs> and join uh, Rachel in one of uh, her uh, online uh, classes or in the field workshops. Thanks. All right. So, yeah. um, do we have any questions about Aurora shooting? Uh, no, no, surprisingly not. Wow. That's. <laughs> you explain <laughs> it all. Okay. How are we doing for time? Still okay? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It uh, could be, you know, photo pillars are, you know, learners, so yeah. we could keep uh, going on forever. <laughs> well, I might need more coffee. I don't know if this would be enough <laughs> if we can go on forever. Well, now it's one hour and 20 minutes, so yeah, 700 people with us now. Okay. Great. All right. So um, if I have a little more time, I'll talk to you a little bit about my gear. Uh, yeah. Uh, as you probably gathered right now, I'm a Sony shooter. I started off shooting Canon and I switched about five years ago. So I really shot with pretty much um, everything. Right now, my uh, my workhorse cameras are the Sony a7R 3 I have two. Um, I just got my hands on the Sony a7S 3 and it's my dream come true for night shooting. And uh, I have ordered, <laughs> sounds so bad. I'm going to have to sell some cameras. Um, I ordered the, a, the new A1, and so I'm getting that in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about that. And I have I have a full range, full suite of lenses um, from primes to, uh, to zooms. And a lot of people ask me about, you know, what camera should I buy? And I find it a really tough question because they're all so capable for night shooting. Um, but I'll kind of run you through some of the, the differences. Um, the mm -hmm. A7S line is their light sensitivity line. So these are 12 megapixel cameras. Even the A7S III is only 12 megapixel cameras. So all of these cameras have the same sensor size, but there's less pixels um, per, per square inch on the mm -hmm. Sony A7S than there is on the Sony a7R 3 for example, or the, the a7R 4 has even more. So what happens then is the a7S line, um, more because the pixels are bigger, they can gather more light. So the lower the resolution, the higher the light sensitivity. When we get up to the a7R 3 and the a7R 4 they have much higher resolution because they have more pixels in the same space. So that gives you more resolution but each pixel is able to gather less light. So they're actually less light sensitive. Mm -hmm. I can still use the a7R 3 to do night shooting. I just have to really, um, I have to do a lot more of that stacking for noise reduction. And, um, and I don't have the freedom and versatility that I do with the a7S, but I have the resolution. So then I can go and you know print those files super big and, and put them on my wall. Does that make sense? Mm. 100%. Okay, cool. Right. So then when it comes to lenses, 
So if I was recommending a camera, I would first ask you like what you want to do with it. You know, are you just shooting for your own personal stuff and you're probably going to post on the web and share with your family and stuff like that. I would highly, highly recommend the a7 III because it's a super versatile camera and has, you know, 24 megapixels as lots. If you were, if you came to me and told me you were like a, a wedding photographer and you wanted to be able to do um, pictures of couples at night under starry skies, I used to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I would highly recommend the A7S III because you can just do so much more with the A7S line than you can with the R line. Um, yeah, and if you're in the professional space or you need to have, you know, you need the resolution to print images larger, I would definitely mm -hmm. go with the R3 or the R4. I mean, it's great too. Um, I've, I've had the experience of using it for night photography. I don't own one, but um, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So um, when nice. it comes to lenses, we have a sort of similar trade-off um, when we move from the primes to the zooms between sharpness and versatility. So our prime lenses are way more sharp than our, than our zoom lenses. Um, my favorite prime lenses are the Sony Zeiss 21 millimeter Loxia. It is one of the sharpest lenses on the market. Um, it's so sharp that you actually get the little, the little spikes on the stars, you know, at f2.8. <laughs> so the same thing that most people have to stop down for to like f11 or f16 to, to get the light burst on a light. I get that at 2.8 on the Loxia. It's pretty wow. crazy. Yeah. Um, the Sony Zeiss Batis is also really nice. I'll back up and say that with the 21 millimeter Loxia, it's also a manual focus lens and it's got a hard stop for focus instead of focus by wire. So mm -hmm. what that means is if you're out there in the middle of the night in the dark, you turn the, the lens all the way to one side and you find infinity and that's focused. So there's not a lot of like sitting there, like, is it focused or isn't it? So if you're, if focus is a trouble for you, highly recommend that lens. Um, the Sony Zeiss 18 millimeter Batis is also super cool. It's um, a focus by wire lens. And basically what that means is you'll be out of focus. And as you turn the focus wheel, it'll come into focus, into focus, into focus. And then it can go out of focus again um, instead of having a hard stop. But what makes this, the Sony Zeiss, a really cool lens is that it has a digital readout on the display um, of the lens. And so if you're at f2.8 on the Sony a7R 3 6 and infinity is focused. So you can actually find focus really quickly and, um, and it's focused every time at that, at that measurement. So it's a really cool lens for mm -hmm. focusing at night. Um, and then the 24 millimeter 1.4, is absolutely incredible. Um, it's a super sharp lens. At 1.4, we've got next to no coma, um, and you know it's incredibly light sensitive because it's so fast. So those are my top three favorite primes. But I do a ton of hiking, and um, I do a lot of. I mean, I've usually got three cameras in my bag, so you can imagine that I can't really carry a whole suite of prime lenses around <laughs> with me. So I do a lot of shooting with the zoom lenses. And um, the trade-off here is that you have more versatility. You have that range. Right mm -hmm. now, my favorite lens is the 12 to 24. Um, and there's so much you can do with a wide angle, a wide angle lens in terms of composition, but that's a whole other talk. Um, so you got that versatility, but you get more coma. You like, you know, the prime lenses, you can use them at any aperture. But because they're a single, you know, a single focal length, it's a lot easier to make sure that to calibrate them in a way where you can get perfectly sharp stars from corner to corner. With the zooms, because there's so many more elements, um, you get you, this is just the trade-off. It's just you get more coma. Um, the 16 to 35 is a sort of a go-to lens for me. I usually have that one on one of my a7r3s and i use it for time lapsing i don't even really take it off um, it's mm -hmm. just a it's just a really great lens um, but there is a little bit of coma in the corners um, and then i like three weeks ago finally got my very own sweet treasure of a lens the 12 to 24 um 28 and there's 
almost no coma. So there's a little bit of elongation in the corners at 12 millimeters and 2.8, but they don't look like little birds. They're just sort of like more like almost little dashes. Um, but for a, for a zoom lens, I just can't even get over how, how sharp it is. It's absolutely incredible. All beautiful All lenses. Beautiful. <laughs> yeah. So um, again, if you're looking for recommendations, it totally depends on what you're doing. If you want the sharpest lens on the planet for night photography, you're probably going to want to go with one of the three primes I mentioned. Um, and if you're looking for the versatility or you don't want to hike around with them like I don't, then you probably want to go with like a 16 to 35 or a 12 to 24. And that's mostly aimed at Sony shooters, of course, but um, Zeiss actually does make these lenses for other cameras as well. So, Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, still good for time? Of course. Okay, cool. All right, so um, I just wanted to kind of give some insight into how I set up my camera for night shooting. Um, there's a couple of really important things for me. One is the focus magnifier. So if you just use the, the focal ring on the, on the lens, you usually get about five times magnification. Well, that's on Sony's anyway, but I think Canon's and Nikon's are similar. If you set up focus magnifier though, and you have it on its own button, you can get to 12 times magnification. Mm -hmm. And so you can imagine then that if you're focusing on a star, you're gonna get way more accurate if you can be 12 times magnified on that scene than if you're five times magnified. So I always have the focus magnifier set up on one of the buttons that I can feel with gloves. Um, that's typically the C1 on my cameras. I'm holding the A7S III though, and it doesn't have a C1 is actually the record for movies. So I have it on the back of my camera. Um, C2 is bright monitoring because that just makes finding a uh, composition at night super easy. Um, <laughs> C3 is steady shot. Uh, when you are on a tripod, you want to make sure that your internal camera stabilization is off. So I always have that one turned off. And then my last one, which is C4, the last button I have, I leave that on a uh, touch screen because when I'm shooting blue hour shots, um, it's really easy to find my focal points because I can just touch the screen and take a shot. So that's how I have my camera set up. Any questions on that? Um, nope. Okay, it seems cool. that you're uh, giving a great presentation, Rachel. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So I already talked to you guys about the gloves from the Heat Company. Um, one last thing I would mention for night shooting is that it can be really fun to have a light for like painting, like light painting or, or illuminating parts of your scene. Um, I use light slots for like shooting the methane bubbles and on the frozen lakes here. Um, and the one that I love the most is uh, it's made by Luxley. Um, they have different mm -hmm. sizes. This one is the viola and it has 99 different brightness settings and you can set it to any color temperature you want. You can also operate it from your phone with an app. So that's really cool because that means you can go place it, you know, 50 feet away from you and you can adjust the brightness and you can adjust the color looking at the back of your camera using the app. So really, really, really handy. So cool. And then I think this is the last thing I'm going to mention. If you have any trouble at all focusing on the stars, I highly recommend this filter. It's called the Sharp Star Filter. It's made by uh, Lonely Spec. And um, so it's a whole apparatus that's going to go onto your lens and then you slide this little plastic filter down and um, what it does is it diffracts the light. So when you're looking at a star, it's going to have an X shape and as you approach focus, there'll be um, a, a line, like a bright line that moves through and it'll just intersect with that X and it's just the easiest way to find focus. Um, some people really struggle with is it focused or isn't it? Um, maybe, <laughs> you know, you have poor eyesight. I have really poor eyesight. And so if I'm ever doing like a test on a new lens, I make sure I have this sharp star filter because I don't want to write a whole review on a lens and then find that it's like user error and I'm just off a little bit. Um, so anytime I'm working with a new piece of equipment or um, if I'm struggling in any way, I, I absolutely highly recommend these this sharp star filter. It, it'll help change your night photography game for sure. Good to know. Definitely uh, the people behind all the spec are genius, uh, Ian Norman and Diane yeah, Southern. Just, yeah. Amazing, amazing people. Amazing technology. 
So the last thing I'll say is that if you can master night shooting, you can master any kind of shooting because it doesn't really matter what kind of situation you find yourself in. You'll have the technical background to really shoot anything you want. This is a shot inside an ice cave in Iceland and there was just the tiniest bit of light and um, yeah, uh, it just is not a problem when, you, when you've when you been <laughs> focusing on the stars and doing, you know, taking multiple shots and combining them all together in post. Um, it just makes It just makes any kind of shooting really, really easy. Yeah, the shapes and the colors in the eyes are just awesome. Yeah. So thank you all for for tuning in and uh, listening to my talk today. I really appreciate all of you being here. And um, I just want to say hi to Andy, who I know is watching today, and Bruce and, um, and Art. Thank you all for tuning in. And I hope to see you again soon. Awesome, Rachel. Thanks so much for uh, for the class. It's, it's been, uh, I mean, an amazing class. And if people want to join one of your workshops, uh, people is to join, uh, go to your website, right? Australiasphotography.com. Yep, absolutely. And yeah, and where else can people find you? Um, they can find me on Instagram and Facebook with, uh, mm -hmm. under Rachel Jones Ross, um, mostly Instagram. And yeah. I'm not, I haven't been really big on social media lately, um, but I have lots of new work to share. So you can expect to see some stuff coming out for me in the next few weeks. And I have a shot that I have to edit and show you guys now that, uh, now that I showed you the raw files, I have to show you how it all comes together. <laughs> You're going to post it on, on Instagram then? Yeah, I will. Yeah. People is like, you know, sharing you in, uh, in the chat, uh, super happy with this class. It's been amazing. Really, Rachel. It's uh, uh yeah, you did a great job. And yeah, please guys follow Rachel, follow her job. She is an amazing photographer, an amazing presenter and teacher, as you've seen. And Rachel, any any last piece of uh, of advice you want to give people or well, I'm always here. If you have any questions, you can feel free to email me uh, through my website or you can DM me on social. Um, I love I love hearing from you and uh, love hearing your questions. So contact me. I'm happy and I'm here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. I mean, I don't know what to say. Just thank you for spending your time with us. It's been uh, amazing. I had a lot of fun. You know, you guys, I'm, I'm not a photographer, but I'm here. Uh, you know, learning from you and it's been, it's been super fun. I'm really, I'm really happy that you invited me and I thank you very much for your patience as I put everything together. So hopefully we can do it again sometime. Yeah. Hopefully we can do something together in a, in a, in life, right? In a workshop yes. or, or something <laughs> yeah. that's going to be super fun. Yes. So thank you so much everybody for watching. Um, as always, if you like uh, this class, just give us, give us a like, a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next video. And remember that you have the power to imagine, plan, and shoot legendary photos. Bye-bye. Bye. See you next time.